<laughs> Thank you. That's great. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Okay, I think we're ready. What do you think? Hey, if you have your Bible, we're going to look at some different verses today, but uh, just to go and start, turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Uh, last week, uh, if you were here last week, I had uh, mentioned to you that I felt like you could summarize Christmas in a phrase that came from the song, Angels from the Realms of Glory, and it was come and worship, come and worship. If you had to kind of distill it down into that one sentence, it's come and worship, and that is come and see the newborn king, Christ the Savior, and then once you see him, then your response is to worship him. Come and worship. And so that's a good phrase to kind of capsulize what Christmas is. But I also think that when you think about Christmas, there are certain words that come to your mind. And if we did like a word association of Christmas, and it could be angels and wise men or uh, manger, uh, shepherds, uh, giving, uh, rejoicing, uh, family. It could be overeating, uh, overextending my credit. It could be overextending my welcome. Uh, things that, that all throughout Christmas, there are different words that come up. But I think that one word that goes and weaves its way through the entire Christmas story that we need to take with us, not just Christmas season, but really through all our life, is the word humble. The word humble. And as you look throughout the Christmas uh, account, you will see this everywhere. And so all throughout Scripture, you'll see where God gives favor to those who are humble. So it's important to God. And he put together this Christmas narrative to where humility runs all the way through it. So let's just break it down and take a look. First of all is humble situation. Humble situation situation. Just when you look at the setting of the Christmas story, there is humility that completely surrounds it. First of all, the genealogy of the earthly father, Joseph. The genealogy of the earthly father, Joseph. Genealogy was really important uh, back then. And when you read through Scripture, you'll see over and over where they talk about uh, this person begat this person begat this person. Everything tracks back uh, to, uh, to Abraham and to his, and, and then on there to Isaac and all the different sons. And so uh, genealogy is so important. And today it's huge. Ancestry.com and other um, organizations, uh, they encourage you to dig into your genealogy. And the, I love the advertisements for those because when you go through it, it, it shows these people who say, oh, I had no idea that so-and-so who was famous uh, is related to me. And you want to have that genealogy, that genealogical breakdown of people that other people would envy you for. You know, wouldn't it be great to have so-and-so in your family lineage? And so we look into that, and we look to see who all the people are that, that uh, have been in our, in our lineage, and, and, and where all did I, did I come from on there? And as great as that is, you would think that when you look at a genealogy leading up to Joseph, who would be the person that would be the earthly father to God's son, that God himself, the creator of the universe, would be able to set it up so it's a really a good list. I mean, it's something that Ancestry.com would just almost salivate over because it's got to be listed with tons of blue bloods all the way through that. But you know what's interesting? When you look at the genealogy, it is far from that. This is not a genealogy that most people would print out and show it to their friends and say, hey, check that out. Nah, nah, there's some real stinkers uh, in, that, in that genealogy. And in fact, if you start in verse five, and, uh, you know, everybody loves the story. I hope if you're a Bible student of Boaz and Ruth, who doesn't love that story? And, and, and you know, if you sit there and say, I don't know that story, it's just four chapters long, it's in the Old Testament, just read it, read it today. It's a great story. And, and every woman wants a Boaz. I mean, he is a man of integrity. Uh, he is a guy that's there for Ruth and takes care of her. And wow, well, it's just a great story, all right? Well, do you know who Boaz's mom was? Rahab. She was a prostitute. She was a prostitute in Jericho. And she was a woman 
who had heard the things that God was doing and that as the Israelites were moving into the promised land, they were getting ready to attack Jericho. And when they sent two spies, she's the one who took those spies and protected them from those who wanted to kill them. And she told her, she says, I've heard of your God, and when you take this city, will you take me also and let me come with you guys on there? So what a great story, but what a tough profession that she had. So you had Rahab, who was a prostitute. Well, then it goes through the line of David. You say, well, David, great king. You know you got to have that. And it went through Solomon. Oh, well, Solomon, he's a good guy. Well, you know who Solomon's mother was? It was Bathsheba. And so what happened was, was David saw Bathsheba, who was married to another man, called her over, had an affair with her, ended up killing her husband so that he could have Bathsheba all for himself. And out of that relationship was born a son named Solomon. And so that could be a little bit of a black mark in it. And a lot of people end right there, but you got to look at it a little bit further. In verse 8, it talks about Jehoshaphat, who was a good king, but he had a son who was Jehoram, and Jehoram was a horrible king. He was a bad king. He took everybody away from God, and yet he's a part of this, this genealogy. Now, if you had to think about some of the worst kings and queens in the history of Israel you would probably vote for Ahab and Jezebel. They were quite the couple. Anybody here name your child Jezebel? Anybody? How about Ahab? We got any of those takers over here? You know, we don't name after those folks because nobody wants to be a part of them. This Jehoram, you know who he married? Jezebel's daughter. He's in the family of Ahab and Jezebel. Now, not only is he a bad king, but he married bad, all right? Well, then you go down to verse 9. It talks about Ahaz. Ahaz, he was an ungodly king of Judah. He was such a bad king that he sacrificed his own son to a foreign god. And then it goes to Manasseh. And I remember even as a child studying the kings, this one always jumped out at me because Manasseh served for 55 years and was horrible. He was a terrible king. And it wasn't just that he had some bad policies, he spilt a lot of innocent blood. And in the Bible, it describes Manasseh. He shed much innocent blood until he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another. He's in the genealogy. This is the genealogy that God has put together to come up, to come up with a man named Joseph who would be the earthly father to his son. God chose that lineage of his son's father. And he could have left it out of scripture or he could have even worded it in such a way that sounded good. And we like to do that. We like to take things and make them sound better than they are. I love the story I read about the Smith family. The Smith family was so proud of their lineage. You know, their parents, or way down the road, came to America on the Mayflower. And as they looked through the lineage of their family, they saw that they had senators and pastors and Wall Street wizards, and they were so proud of all their lineage. However, there was that great uncle George who died in the electric chair because of crimes that he had committed. And they're trying to figure out what do we do about him? So they wanted to put together this record of the uh, genealogy of of their family. And as they put it together, they had to figure out what you do with the great uncle George who died by electrocution in the electric chair. And so they hired a famous author and he came and they explained the situation to him. He says, don't worry about it. I can handle it. I can handle it tactfully. So sure enough, the book was written. It was attributed to the family. First thing they did, they flipped over the pages. So what did he say about great uncle George? And this is what he said. George Smith occupied a chair of applied electronics at an important government institution. He was attached to his position by the strongest of ties, and his death came as a real shock. (laughs) Now, Joseph had a genealogy that you could have smoothed over the wording, but God didn't do that. He had enough shady characters in it that he would not be prideful and he would not be boastful. It's a genealogy that would humble him. And that's really the way that God wanted to have it. That's the way he wanted it. And so you just even start out from a humble setting and a situation, you see the genealogy and second of all, the economic and social status of Mary and Joseph. The economic and social status of them. 
In Matthew chapter 13, when Jesus was speaking in Nazareth and they were shocked over his wisdom, they made this comment. They said, is this not the carpenter's son? So that's Joseph, the carpenter. Is this not the carpenter's son? And so Joseph was a carpenter. When you're a carpenter, it doesn't mean that economically you're going to hang out with the elite. It doesn't mean that from a social status, you're there with the blue bloods. Not at all. Just a common man, common financially, and also social status. Well, what about Mary? Well, in Luke chapter 1, verse 48, it says, for God has looked on the humble estate of his servant. She is talking about when the angel came to her and to tell her that she was going to be the one that was going to be the mother of the Christ child. It says, for God has looked on the humble estate of his servant. Humble estate. That most likely refers to the status of her being a low social class in an occupied country. They were occupied by the Romans. They had restricted freedoms. And on top of that, she was in a low social, social class. And they said, you, I, God looked upon your humble estate. Mary was a teenager, probably between 15 and 17 years of age. She was a Jewish peasant girl with no connections to society or royalty or wealth or even education. But that's who God chose. And it says that Joseph and Mary were from a town called Nazareth. This is like a two-bit town. Nazareth was a frontier town that had about 1,600 to 2,000 residents at that time. It was not an important part of the national or religious life of the nation of Israel. They were crude people, and they had a bad reputation in both morals and religion. And in fact, in John chapter 1, when Jesus was uh, first introducing himself to some followers, Philip was with Jesus, and he went to tell his good friend Nathaniel. He says, I think I've met the Messiah, and he's from Nazareth. And the response from him was, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, Nazareth is about as low as you can get. And so what happened? That's where God chose. The economic and the social status of Mary and Joseph. They were low, they were humble, and they weren't from some big to-do town. And third of all is the birthplace of Jesus. I mean, he wasn't even born in Nazareth. He was born in Bethlehem as they had to travel to register for taxation. But where was he born? He was born in a stable, born in a cave. And what type of bassinet, what type, what type of, of a crib did he have? It was a feeding trough is where the king of kings was placed. The greatest king was born in the humblest place. And then what about the first visitors? The first visitors that ever came to see the newborn baby were the shepherds. And in Luke chapter 2, it talks about how the angel spoke to the shepherds. And shepherds, hey, let's go see who this child is. And in today's world, we elevate shepherds. We say, oh, it's great. They're hanging out with cute sheep. And they're doing great work out there. And let's get those shepherds in there and go see who Jesus is and tell the world. Shepherds were looked down upon. Ritually, they were unclean. They couldn't even go in, into worship. They were ritually unclean. They were people that, pe that, that were looked down upon, and they were so looked down upon that if there was a court trial that came up, you could not call a shepherd to come in and to be a witness. They could not even testify in court. And what about God's sense of humor? He selected the same men who nobody would trust to testify in court to be the men that would be the first people that would see the Christ child, hear what Mary and Joseph had to say, hear what the angels had to say, and it says they left there glorifying, praising God, and telling others what they'd seen. Isn't that great? The most unlikely messengers. The whole thing is built on humility. That whole situation starts out humble. But then let me do the second part, and that's the humble spirit of Mary and Joseph. The humble spirit of Mary and Joseph. There's not a lot said about Joseph, but in Matthew chapter 1, verse 19, it says that Moses was, I mean, excuse me, that Joseph was a just man. Joseph was a just man. That means he's a man of quality. He was respected in the community. Now, we know he was a craftsman, says he was a carpenter, and if you can just imagine that he grew up in a small town and they said he's a just man, that means that everybody liked him. He's the guy that every woman probably wanted their daughter to marry. You need to be like Joseph. He's a good man. He's a craftsman. He's got a skill. He's a hard worker. He's well-respected. And then word came out, guess what? Joseph, 
He's engaged to Mary. He said, oh, lucky woman. Lucky girl, lucky guy. Everybody's excited for him. I mean, they're going to come together. They're going to get married. They're going to, he's going to set up shop right here in Nazareth. And this is where they'll spend their life. They'll have a family. They'll raise their kids here. And won't it be great? And everybody's got it laid out how perfect this would be. You see, he was a just man. But then where you really find out what Joseph was like is that after a few months in their engagement, she turns up to be pregnant. And he knows that he's not the earthly father of that child. And so he's offended, he's embarrassed, he's angry. Yet his first thought is not about himself or how he could get vengeance or her or even worried about what the town would think about him. It was how could he protect Mary through this time? What a different response. And in fact, in verse 19, in Matthew chapter 1, he says, he was unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Unwilling to put her to shame. He knew he wasn't the father. So the only logical explanation is that she'd been unfaithful to him. And so he could have made a big public stink about this, and he would have had the court of public opinion on his side. Nobody would have protected Mary. Everybody would have been on his side. He had it going for him. He had the argument down. He could have shamed her right there, but he didn't. He loved her. And because he was a just and a humble man, his actions were not to embarrass her. His actions were not to embarrass her. You see, a humility of spirit that flows throughout Joseph, who was going to be the earthly father for Jesus Christ. Well, that's the dad, or what about the mom? What about Mary? Well, you get an idea of her spirit, where in Luke chapter 1, verse 30, it says, the angel says, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You have found favor with God. It means that God is pleased with her, and the result of his favor is that God is choosing you, Mary, to be the earthly mother of his son, Jesus. The Lord has found favor on you. Now, the Bible talks about that God gives favor to the humble. Luke 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. And that's a quote from Proverbs 3, 34. Think about that. What does God do? He opposes the proud, but he gives favor to the humble. The angel says to Mary, God has given his favor to you. She has a humble spirit. And because of that humble spirit, he says, you're the one that will be the earthly mother for my son, Jesus Christ. And her response is, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Her response, now just think about this. She's a teenager. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit says, you're going to be great with child, and it will be through the Holy Spirit. And I'm just laying this out to you. What is your response? And her response was, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. That word servant is a word that means a handmaiden. It means about the lowest form of a servant as you can get. Total submission. And her submission is an example of incredible courage because she will become an object of suspicion to Joseph. She'll be an object of ridicule and suspicion to everyone there in Nazareth. Her reputation will be at stake. However, she bows to the divine will and she tells God, I am your servant. Whatever it is, I totally yield myself to you. You think about humility and how it just weaves through all the Christmas story. And you see just the whole situation of everything from his genealogy uh, all, all the way through to their setting, to their social and economic status, to how the baby was born, and to the first people to see it through the shepherds. And then you pick up on the spirit that you have, the spirit of Joseph and the spirit of Mary. And you can see that out of all creation, how God chose these two people how do you do that to choose these two people and say, this is the one that will have the care of raising my son, Jesus Christ? So you have that humble situation. You've got the humble spirits of those, but you also have a humble Savior. 
And it's interesting because as Jesus was born, as he lived his life, you see his humility. First of all, was in his in incarnation. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse nine says this, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Look at that again. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, was rich, though he was rich, that means that he was there with God. He possessed all the privileges, the power, and the wisdom of God. Though he was rich, yet for your sake and my sake, he became poor. He became poor. It means he gave all of that up to step onto earth to become human being. 100% God, 100% human. And he laid aside all the great privileges of heaven so that you by his poverty might become rich. You by his poverty may become rich, not rich in money, but rich in the fact that you can have a right relationship with God and you can gain eternal life because of what Jesus did. His whole purpose is circled with humility. And in his incarnation, stepping out of heaven onto earth, he humbled himself to become a servant of lowly human beings. Second of all, when you think about a humble saver, uh, you think about his words and his actions. His words and his actions. Throughout his teachings, Jesus says, he that wants to be the greatest of you needs to be the least. And that you need to be the one that serves others. And it's not just the lesser serve the greater, but the greater serve the lesser. And so he taught this throughout his three years, but he tried to make it as clear and as indelible in the minds of his apostles. And so he waited to that last supper that they had. And that last supper, right before he was to be arrested, and they all showed up for the Passover meal. And when all these men came walking in, the foot washer didn't show up. Because there's usually always at some gathering, some slave, some servant who washes everybody's feet because you're walking around in sandals through mud and sewage and everything else. So you take your shoes off at the door, then you clean a person's feet, and then you go in and eat. And if you saw the way they ate, you definitely want the, the shoes to be clean because they lay on these couches. There's nothing worse than someone laying on a couch and you've got some feet of someone been walking through mud and sewage right there in your face. Hey, you want something else to eat? No, I think I'm done. Uh, this is enough. And so it just makes sense. Let's, let's clean those feet off. But there was no foot washer there. It was great because when all those guys came and they looked around, they kind of noticed there wasn't a foot washer, but they took their shoes off anyway, and they just kind of standing there with dirty feet looking around. And naturally in their minds, they said, well, I don't know who's going to do it, but I guarantee it ain't going to be me uh, over here. Somebody's got to come. And of all things, <laughs> the Son of God, Takes a towel, wraps it around his waist, tells everyone just sit down. Takes a bucket of water, takes his towel, and begins to wash their feet. And as he washes each one of their feet, he then looks at them <clears throat> and he says, in essence, I've been telling you over and over about how we need to be servants to all. I just want to let you know, what I have just done for you, you need to do for others. Even as I, the master, have washed your feet, you also need to wash the feet of others. And that others included those guys sitting right around him, your peer group. It's a lot easier to wash the feet of those that are above you. Sometimes it's pretty easy to wash those below, but it's that peer group is where it gets difficult. Because that's pretty well who you're in competition with. And he said, you need to wash their feet. There was humility. And humility, not only in the words that he taught, but also in his actions that would stay with those men for the rest of their lives. Humility. Humility in his incarnation, humility in his words and his actions, and humility in his death. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, In being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Remember during his trial and, uh, you know, all the uh, Roman leaders are saying, hey, we've got you right here and uh, you need to abide by our rule. And he looks up and says, listen, all I got to do is say the word or snap my fingers and uh, there'll be a legion of angels that'll come down here and, uh, and, and it'll be a whooping. Okay? 
and uh, just a nice way of putting that. And uh, they, can, they can take everyone out. All I got to do is say the word. They're sitting on the edge of heaven right now. And he says, but he humbled himself because nobody forced Christ down the cross for our sins. He chose to do this. He chose to do this. And I love in one of the counts in the gospel when they came to arrest him and they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am he. And it says they all backed away. <laughs> and he had to encourage them to, to arrest him. And he said, hey, I'm the guy. Come and do your business. Because he knew why he was sent and that was to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. And so in his death, there was a, a humbling. He humbled himself. He had all the resources of heaven that could come and keep him from doing that but he chose not to use them. He chose to follow his father's will. And he said, I will go to the cross and I will pay the penalty for the sins of all mankind. And it was out of, out of that humility that led him to the cross and it led him to complete it. Because at any time in those six hours with, suspended between heaven and earth, he could have come down from the cross. When they said, hey, come down to the cross and prove to us that you're the son of God. You know what? He could have done that. He could have just stepped right down on there and says, hey, is this, is this proof enough? But that wasn't his purpose. His purpose was to die for our sins. Someone had to pay that penalty, and he was willing to do that and to atone for our sins. Humble Savior. So you take all this, the situation, the spirit, the Savior, how does that relate to us? Let me close with this, and that is the humble steps in Christmas 2018. Humble steps in Christmas 2018. As you are in this Christmas season, and over these next few weeks as we're enjoying all that happens in Christmas, I would hope that this message could resonate with you and you think about humility during this season. Humble steps, I've got two. Number one is this, totally yield yourself to God. Totally Yield yourself to God. Totally, everything. <laughs> yield, give to him. Totally yield yourself to God. Andrew Murray, a pastor in the 19th and 20th centuries, said humility is the displacement of self and the enthronement of God, by the enthronement of God. Displacement of self by the enthronement of God. I remember... Um, uh, growing up, and you guys helped me with this. How many of y'all are familiar with the four spiritual laws in Campus Crusade? Raise your, raise your hands over here. Just raise them up high. I'm not going to ask you to repeat them on there. Wow, isn't that scary? It's not a whole lot of hands. How about choir? Any of y'all heard four spiritual laws? Yeah, y'all are older. Thank you. All right. <laughs> I mean, that was staple tool back when I was in school. It was four spiritual laws. And you went through the four laws uh, to get you to the point to where you pray a prayer and receive Christ as Savior. But uh, then there was another book. We call it the bird book. You kind of had the Holy Spirit on there. And, and it, was, it talked about in there, and I think the four spiritual laws talked about it. It says that there's a circle and there was a throne. And it says something will be on the throne of your life. Something will, will run your life. And it says it's either yourself or either it's God. And they draw this circle and they put a throne, and you would either have a cross down here outside the throne, or the cross on the throne. And when you totally yield your life to Christ, it means that he is on the throne of your life. And you look at that definition, humility is the displacement of self, instead of Danny being on the throne, by the enthronement of God. To where now, all of a sudden, it is God that guides and directs my life. It is God whom I look to to say, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? How should I act? What are my next steps? Because you're on the throne of my life. And there's always a battle between who is going to be on the throne. And just because I place him there on Sunday, December 9th, does not guarantee he'll be there on Tuesday, December 11th. Because Danny always wants to climb back up on the, stone, on the throne and kind of push him down because I really enjoy being in charge of everything rather than him being in charge. And where I really get in, char in trouble in my life is when I'm the guy in charge and he's relegated to second, third, fourth place. Humility, what humility is, is when I displace myself and I enthrone God 
totally yield yourself to God. It's a freedom from arrogance that grows out of the recognition that all that we have and all that we have, it comes from God. We understand and we practice a total dependence on God. Humility. It's kind of hard to get your hands around. It's an inner discipline. It's a feeling towards God that he has absolute rights over your life, that he can do with you as he pleases, and that he has absolute authority to tell you what is best for you. And you know what? You don't have a problem with that. Now, a lot of us have a problem when somebody's trying to tell us what we need to do. Somebody comes, hey, I'll tell you what you need to do. A lot of times when somebody starts out with that statement, hey, I'll tell you what you need to do, we start backing up, start putting up the defense. But you know what? When we are humble, totally yielded to God, we open up God's word and God says, i tell you what you need to do. You know what we do? We lean in. Tell me. He says, this is what you need to do. And you say, I'm all over it. I'm all over it. Let's go. That's what humility is. You see, Lord, I don't want it to be Danny Wood. I want it to be what you want me to do. I want to be totally yielded to you. I want to be submitted to you as my master and my boss. I want to be the clay in the master's hand, and I want you to shape me, mold me the way that you want me on there. We just don't see humility enough. It's not the norm in our me-first culture that we live in. But you know, when you see it, it definitely stands out. Now, the funny thing about humility is you can acknowledge it in others, but you can't claim it for yourself. Doesn't that make sense? You can acknowledge it in others. Hey, you're a humble guy. But you can't claim it yourself. You can say, hey, I just want to let you know I'm humble. All right. Can't do that. I told you that story before. I just love that little illustration about the community that voted the pastor, and they voted that this pastor was the most humble man in the community, and they gave him an award. And he took the award and he hung it up in his office and the next week they came and took it down. They said, you are prideful to put your award up there. You can't win. What happens when someone says, hey, you are such a humble person. What are you supposed to say? Yeah? (laughs) And they said, you failed the test. No humility for you, all right? Uh, No, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to do that. Oh, it's hard by acknowledging that. But it is great when you see someone that is humble. And um, I know many of you may have watched uh, portions of uh, President uh, George H.W. Bush's funeral. And uh, what, a, what a great assignment for any young person just to read some of the transcripts of what was said in that funeral. To see a man who was being honored not because of his position, but because of the type of man that he was. Not just the fact that he had served as a president and all the other things he did but just the kind of man that he was. One of my favorite statements came from Alan Simpson, who was a retired senator from Wyoming. And in my life of growing up, I I didn't agree with everything Alan Simpson was for, but if he ever spoke, I'd always listen to him because I thought he had a great sense of humor and just the way he phrased things. And as he spoke at the funeral, this is what he said. And George Bush was a man of such great humility And those who travel the high road of humility in Washington, D.C. are not bothered by heavy traffic. That's a great statement. If you travel the road of humility, you're not going to be bothered by heavy traffic. And it's not just Washington, D.C. It's all around us. You travel that road of humility, there are not going to be a lot of folks traveling with you. But we need to. Totally yield yourself to God and seek a humble spirit. And the last thing is just think of others. Think of others. That's a part of what humility is. It's not all about myself. It's thinking of others. Humility means that we're liberated to serve others at God's direction rather than trying to impress others. Humility means that we're feeling indebted to all people because of how graciously God has treated us. I then in turn need to treat others. It's the opposite of feeling that everybody owes you something. It owes me strokes or owes me time. And the more you're driven by what others owe you rather than by what you owe them in love and service, the less humble you are. So think of others. Take the focus off yourself and think of others. And Christmas is that perfect time. It's not so much how much am I going to get, but it's what can I do for other people? 
what can I do to help others, to lift them up, to provide something for them? Now, I just want to brag on this church. This is one of the most generous churches I've, I've ever known. And uh, there are so many pulls at you, and there's so many pulls at what we have just as a church from a financial standpoint of, of whether it be just our operating budget, and then we have Make Jesus Known, and, and now we're moving into his capital campaign and people giving over and above for that. And then all of a sudden, we place before you uh, needs for those that are involved in foster care. And there were, were backpacks that we encourage people to get a backpack and fill it up uh, with items in there. And so that whenever a foster child uh, goes from one home to another or gets placed into a home that's not carrying their stuff in a plastic bag, but they've got a nice backpack to be able to place that in. And then there were some Christmas wishes that those that were in foster care system uh, had. And, and, um, and for some, there may not have been much of a Christmas they would have ever had without this. And we encouraged our people to pick those up. And then there was these diaper bags uh, that we encourage you to get and place a lot of stuff in that and provide those. And, and these were with DHR and with the Alabama Baptist Children's Home on that. And uh, I'm just thrilled to know that we, we picked up over 700, 650 uh, of those items of backpacks, diaper bags, wish lists, people in our church, six, over 650, picked those up and put all the items in there. And they, they kind of got to be a little pricey by the time you put everything in there, but it didn't matter. Because you saw the need and then you followed up on it. You were thinking of others. And that is so great. There was a church in this city that was going to help with backpacks. And they had to back out at the last minute. And so our staff and our volunteers made the decision and said, tell you what, we'll take it. And you did. You took on extra beyond what you should have taken. And you went over and above and met every need. And so thinking of others this is what we need to do. We need to do this individually, and that's what we need to do it as a congregation. Humility. It goes throughout all the Christmas story. The humility just of the situation in itself. Everything from the genealogy of, of Joseph uh, to the economic and social status of he and, and Mary to even when you think about uh, where he was born and to the very first visitors, that whole thing was based with humility. And then you, you not only see that, but you see the spirit of Mary and Joseph, that humble spirit that they had. And out of that humility, they were like the perfect couple to be able to raise God's son. And then Jesus, wow, he was humble through all of his life, his incarnation, his words, his actions, his death, all of that displayed humility. And then we come to us to take that next step, totally yielding ourselves, totally submitting ourselves to Christ. And then at the same time, when we do that, we take the emphasis off ourselves and we begin to think about others and say, what can I do for them? Not so much what they can do for me, but what can I do for them? Lord, how can you use me to help someone else? And when we put all of that together and we become individuals who are humble servants of God's kingdom, I just really believe that God will be able to use us as individuals and us as a corporate body in amazing ways to influence not only this community, but everywhere that our reach goes. Because you see, God has favor on the humble. And let's humble ourselves. You can't puff up humility, that's the great thing about it. It's nothing we're gonna brag about. It's between us and the Lord and say, I want to be totally yielded to you. I want to be your humble servant. Let me ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes just a moment. Heavenly Father, I thank you that when you, when you set the whole stage for this Christmas story and for the ministry of your son, that humility was a thread that went through it all. And Father, I thank you that when we become followers of yours, and we began to think about, okay, what's it going to take? What am I I'm going to have to do? What are, what are the requirements? What are the expectations? It's amazing that the expectation you give is a total yielding, a total submission to you. And when we totally submit our lives to you in humility, 
then that's what your desire is. Because once that happens, you then begin to clearly lay out a pathway to where you can use us for your honor and glory. And so, Lord, today, as we are celebrating this incredible Christmas season, may you speak to each one of our hearts and guide us towards being that humble servant, totally yielded to you. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.